Please don't put the glass to me I don't think that I have done Of a CD-ROM, which is to say none, right? When was the last time you had a CD-ROM, right? right? Like there is this danger that we will someday convince people that the entire contract that relates to how you and your book should, should get along is, um, is, is, is contained in like you know, a 50,000 word garbage legalese novella that you have to click I agree to and that all the unspoken cultural stuff is just not important and, and, and if we actually convince people of this, which we might it will be a really bad day for writing and book selling and publishing economically right, like, like we we buy books for um kind of like social and cultural reasons that are not the reason that we buy granola bars and if we turn books into granola bars that you read it will be to the great detriment of the publishing industry and amazon really wants a book to be an asim right just a skew just a just a like a nine digit alphanumeric um, that is like sequentially between a plumbing fitting Please and a Chinese sex toy with uh, dangerous contaminants me. in its plastic. You know, we've come full circle because yep. this was the same observation Dana Boyd had about MySpace, which is wasn't the individual contributions on MySpace, it was the connections. What makes a book important as opposed to a granola bar is the conversation that the author is having with its readers, with her readers, and uh, and it is the connections that make the difference. Yeah, and I don't think, oh, well, now that Corey said that, I'm going to just carefully turn my camera. There we go. So I look more scholarly. Oh, you do have a few books. books one well. or two. One or two. Take out, I, you have to have a ladder to get to them. Okay. <laughs> but this is the thing. I, as a, as a child, I grew up in a house without any books in it, right? And really? So um, I, I did. And I was I was one of those kids who was always starving for something to read. And so I would go to the library. I would read libraries like a locust. And I would go to the local charity shop. And I would negotiate with the softest touch volunteer to get the, the books of, you know, for about boarding schools and ponies for like one cent each. And I would turn a home with this huge pile of them. Um, and, and, and so I remember what it's like to be starving for something to read like my to read pile up there right now is is oppressive in a different kind of way but i'm never gonna forget just absolutely being starving for, for new stuff to read and i don't think that there are many authors out there who don't think that we should have libraries authors feel like they are on the same side as libraries authors want their books to be read but we do like i said we need to find ways of paying for them and so for example um there's something in 34 different countries in the world called a public lending right which says, okay, we really want um, libraries to be able to have books in them, but we also really want authors to be able to eat. And so there's like a state subsidy that says, thanks very much for writing these books. When they're held in libraries or borrowed in libraries, we're going to give you some money from centralized revenue. We have this in Australia. We've just extended it to ebooks and audiobooks. It's a great thing, right? Because it's not it's not attached to who owns the copyright, right? We give a certain portion of it to the author, which is the lion's share, and we give a bit to the publisher as well. And we say, thank you very much. Much. There's one way that we could do it if we if we wanted to, to actually make sure that libraries had books, people could read them, and authors could get fed. And I want to mention uh, another great link which I've put in our spreadsheet as well. It's authored it by um, several academics from NYU, including some good friends of Rebecca's and mine: uh, Jason Schultz, Michael Weinberg, Claire Woodcock, and Sarah Lambden. It's called the Anti-Ownership Ebook Economy, and and it really gets into the the how the sausage gets made in ebook lending and libraries and the fact that there's like one monopoly platform that does most of that lending that's owned by a, a terrible rapacious private equity company uh, KKR that um, okay, they just buy they just bought someone they just bought somebody uh, I just saw uh, God I'm blanking on it hang on I, I know I blogged it uh, yeah so, so you know it's, it's, it's a great paper
all the rest. ExpressVPN. Uh, oh, and I'm trying to remember uh, where it was. But it talked about how they, how their technology stack goes to protect your privacy. So you all understand, VPN is a virtual private network. It encrypts your traffic from your computer to a server somewhere in the world, and then nobody can see what you're doing between your server and the server at the other end, your computer and the server at the other end. Now, of course, this assumes.
stream in HD video uh, with zero buffering. It's also very easy. You don't need, it's not, it sounds, I'm making it sound technical, it's not. It works on everything you've got. iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux. You can put it on your router. In fact, they even sell very good, by the way, very good routers with ExpressVPN built in. So you don't need any technical skills. Put the app, I'll give you an example. Put the app on your phone. Fire it up. You press one button. It connects to the fastest server near you. Or choose the locale you want to emerge onto the internet in. You can do that very easily with a little drop down. And, and you're in. So easy. Everybody can use it. And that's important because privacy is important to everybody. Security is important to everybody. Not just me. Mashable, The Verge, many tech journals rate ExpressVPN.
is not right, mate. So they no, passed a law. Accent in Australia. <laughs> the accent. It's terrible. It's the worst. I know. I'm sorry. And uh, it's worse than my French accent. And then <laughs> Good Logan Paul. <laughs> really? That bad? Uh, and.